So welcome to unit, uh, what unit? 13, <laughs> Treatment of Abnormal Behavior. Uh, these slides align with Meyer Psychology for the AP course, third edition. Uh, today, I'm gonna be going over module 70, Introduction to Therapy in Psychodynamic and Humanistic Therapies. So there are three learning targets for this module. Um, first, to be able to contrast psychotherapy and biomedical therapies. Second, to discuss the goals and techniques of psychoanalysis and examine how they have been adapted into the more modern psychodynamic therapy. Third, to distinguish the basic themes of humanistic therapy and describe the specific goals and techniques of Carl Rogers' client-centered approach. So what is the difference between psychotherapy and biomedical therapy? Well, psychotherapy is treatment involving psychological techniques. It consists of interactions between a trained therapist of some kind. It could be a psychologist or a mental health practitioner, a counselor, a psychiatrist, um, and someone seeking to overcome psychological difficulties or to achieve personal growth. Now, biomedical therapy are prescribed medications or procedures that act directly on the person's physiology. So how might an illness be treated by each? Well, uh, in psychotherapy, the therapist may explore a client's early relationships, encourage the client to adopt new ways of thinking, or coach the client in replacing old behaviors with new ones. With biomedical therapy, a psychiatrist or medical doctor, in some cases, um, psychologists that have um, gotten prescription privileges, um, may prescribe antidepressants for for a person with severe depression or may suggest um, a, a techniques like ECT, electroconvulsive shock therapy, or deep brain stimulation. If you are taking the AP exam, a tip is that most of the treatments that are discussed in this unit come from the perspectives that, that we've been talking about. <laughs> so most of them kind of go back and touch upon the things that were introduced to you in unit one, psychologies, history, and approaches. So while reading each major section on therapy, try to think about how a psychologist from the perspective that it's discussing would approach the therapy. You know, we've learned a bit about Freud if you've been following along with all of these modules. So like if you're thinking about it, what would Freud do in an encounter in a therapy session? This should help you kind of organize the information for the AP exam. So what is the eclectic approach to therapy? And it's an approach, and this is how I've always, when I used to be a practitioner, um, I defined my approach to, to uh, therapy or counseling in general, an approach to psychotherapy that uses techniques from various forms of therapy. So taking different pieces of the therapeutic techniques from different, um, from different approaches to come up with an eclectic approach. Some therapists combine techniques, indeed many do, and they, dis they um, describe their approach as eclectic using a blend of therapies from different sort of approaches. So for instance, a therapist may use dream interpretation or free association during sessions, which would be thought of as more psychoanalytic, but also help you change your flawed or faulty thinking patterns, uh, which would be more of a cognitive approach. So psychoanalysis, you guys should be, if you followed along in this class, you should be able to recognize that guy on the left as Sigmund Freud. He believed that patients' free associations, resistances, dreams, and transferences, and the therapist's interpretation of them released previously re repressed feelings, allowing patients to gain self-insight. And he labeled this technique that he developed psychoanalysis. So what are some of the underlying beliefs of psychoanalysis? Well, Freud believed that in therapy, people could achieve healthier, less anxious living by releasing the energy they had previously devoted to those id, ego, super ego conflicts. If you remember back to module 55, those were discussed back then. Freud assumed that we do not fully know ourselves. He believed, think about that iceberg, there's so much under, you know, deep within us in our unconscious that we don't even realize about ourselves. He believed there are threatening things we repress, push down, things we don't want to know, so we disavow or dis deny them. So free association was a technique that Freud used, but how did it work? So imagine yourself as a patient using free association. You begin by relaxing, perhaps by lying on a couch. The psychoanalyst who sits out of your line of vision asks you to say aloud whatever comes to your mind. 
So at one moment, you're relating a childhood memory and another you're describing a dream or recent experience. Soon you start noticing how you edit your thoughts as you speak. You pause for a second before uttering an embarrassing thought. You may omit what seems trivial, irrelevant, or shameful. Sometimes your mind goes blank and you clutch up, unable to remember important details. You may joke or change the subject to something less threatening. That would be a technique I would use probably. Um, so in psychoanalysis, there's a term resistance, and that refers to the blocking from consciousness of anxiety-laden material. So the stuff that you don't kind of want to bubble up to the surface, you resist it coming to the surface. To the analyst, the mental blocks and editing that occur during free association indicate resistance. They hint that anxiety lurks and you're defending yourself against something sensitive, some sort of sensitive material. The analyst will note your resistance and then provide insight into the meaning of it. In psychoanalysis, the analyst noting supposed dream meetings, resistances, and other significant behaviors and events in order to present insight. That's called interpretation. If offered at the right moment, the therapist's interpretation of, say, something like you not wanting to talk about your mother or call, text, or messenger may illuminate the underlying wishes, feelings, and conflicts you're trying to avoid. So a big part of psychoanalysis is the interpretation by the psychoanalyst. Transference in psychoanalysis is the patient's transfer to the, ther to the analyst the emotions linked with other relationships, such as love or hatred for a parent. It's transferred to the analyst. Over many sessions, your relationship patterns surface in your interaction with your therapist. You may find yourself experience, experiencing strong positive or negative feelings for your analyst. The analyst may suggest you're transferring feelings such as dependency or mingled love and anger that you experienced in earlier relationships with family members or perhaps other important people in your life. So what are some drawbacks of traditional psychoanalysis? So relatively few North American therapists now offer the more uh, traditional Freudian psychoanalysis. Much of its underlying theory is not supported by scientific research. Analyst interpretations cannot be proven or disproven. If you remember, that's called falsifiable. Psychoanalysis takes considerable amounts of time as well and lots and lots and lots and lots of money, often over years, which can be very problematic. Some of these problems have been addressed in modern psychodynamic perspectives that have evolved from psychoanalysis. So this psychodynamic therapy is therapy deriving from that original psychoanalytic tradition, but it views individuals as responding to unconscious forces and childhood experiences and seeks to enhance self-insight. So it sounds very similar. Although influenced by Freud's ideas, Psychodynamic therapists don't talk as much about id, ego, superego conflicts. Instead, they try to help people understand their current problems, the current symptoms, by focusing on important relationships, including some childhood experiences and the therapist-client relationship. So what are some differences? Well, the client-therapist meeting takes place once or twice a week rather than several times weekly, and often for only a few weeks or months. Rather than lying on a couch, out of the therapist's line of vision, clients meet with their therapist face-to-face -face and gain perspective by exploring defended against thoughts and feelings. So insight therapies are therapies aimed to improve psychological and fu functioning by increasing a person's awareness of underlying motives and defenses. Because they share the goal of helping patients gain insight into their problems, the psychodynamic and humanistic therapies are often referred to as insight therapies. But, but even though they're often referred to as the same type of overall therapy, they differ greatly <laughs> in many ways. So what are some of the ways that humanistic therapies differ from psychoanalytic therapies? Well, humanistic therapies aim to boost people's self-fulfillment by helping them grow in self-awareness and self-acceptance. The path to growth is taking immediate responsibility for one's feelings and actions, rather than sort of looking back, trying to uncover hidden determinants of the behaviors that are problematic. Promoting growth, not curing illness, is the therapy focus in humanistic therapy. Individuals in therapy are referred to as clients rather than patients as well. So conscious thought, and that's some other differences, conscious thoughts are more important 
within humanistic therapy than unconscious thoughts. The present and future are more important than the past in humanistic therapy. Therapy focuses on exploring feelings as they occur, rather on achieving insights into the childhood origins of those feelings. So client-centered therapy is a humanistic therapy developed by Carl Rogers, which should be a familiar name if you've been following along these uh, the earlier modules, in which the therapist uses techniques such as active listening with an acceptance, accepting genuine empathic environment, um, unconditional positive regard to facilitate clients' growth. This is also known client-centered or person-centered therapy. In this, it's non-directive as well. The client leads the discussion, but isn't trying to direct the discussion. The therapist listens without judging or interpreting and refrains from directing the client towards certain insights. So hopefully you can see how it's very, while they're both insight therapies, um, psychoanalytic slash psychodynamic versus human center, humanistic, they do have some significant differences. So what were Carl Rogers' beliefs about growth and how to help clients achieve it. Well, believing that most people possess the resources for growth, Rogers encouraged therapists to foster that growth by exhibiting these characteristics. Acceptance, genuineness, and empathy were extraordinarily important in the person-centered approach, client-centered approach. When therapists enable their clients to feel unconditionally accepted, drop their facades, and genuinely express who they really are, their true feelings, and empathically sense and reflect their client's feelings, the clients may deepen their self-understanding and self-acceptance. So that is what humanistic therapies, Carl Rogers' person-centered therapy, that is the crux of it. So active listening is an empathic listening technique in which the listener echoes, restates, and clarifies. So, uh, and this, uh, this is taking me back because this is a, um, very much how I learned my first, uh, my first graduate course in therapy was very much uh, focused on this sort of Rogerian, these sort of Rogerian techniques. So to Roger, Roger's hearing was active listening. The client-centered therapist echoes, restates, and seeks clarification of what the person expresses, verbally or non-verbally, and acknowledges those expressed feelings. Active listening is now an accepted part of counseling practices in many schools, colleges, and clinics. So what does active listening actually look and sound like? Now, this is just an image, and there are lots of, you can go onto YouTube and find some different videos. Um, especially interesting are the videos uh, with a client named Gloria, um, who was actually, um, went through therapy with three different uh, therapists, including Carl Rogers. Uh, and you can, see, I think it was Carl Rogers, Albert Ellis, and Fritz Perls to see different te techniques in action with the same client. And Carl Rogers practiced active listening um, in this therapy session. And he's really, you know, if you, he just really is unbelievably empathic and reflects what the client is saying back to them so they can gain insight on their own. So here's an example of active listening and dialogue. So Rogers would say something like, Feeling that now, hmm, that you're just not good to yourself, not good to anybody, never will be any good to anybody, just that you're completely worthless, huh? Those really are lousy feelings. Just feel that you're not good at all. And the client may say something like, yeah, that's what this guy I went to town with just the other day told me. And then Rogers may say something like, basically reflecting back what the client is saying. This guy you went to town with told you you were no good. Is that what you're saying? Did I get that right? So he's basically just reflecting back what the client is saying. And the client says, mm-hmm. Um, I guess the meaning of that, if I get it right, is here that somebody meant something to you and, does, and what does he think of you? Why he's told you he thinks you're no good at all. And that just really knocks the props out from under you, right? It brings you to tears. And then the client may say something like, I don't care. And Rogers may say something like, well, you tell yourself you don't care, but somehow I guess parts of you care, cares because you're weeping over it. I paraphrase some of that, but that's like an idea of what a session with Carl Rogers um, in this client-centered, uh, person-centered therapy would look like. Unconditional positive regard. I mentioned that a few moments ago. This is a caring, accepting, non-judgmental attitude, which Rogers believed would help clients develop self-awareness and self-acceptance. Given a non-judgmental, grace-filled environment that provides unconditional positive regard, people may accept even their worst 
worst traits, like even the things that we feel most badly about ourselves, if we're in an environment with unconditional positive regard, we may still be able to feel valued and whole. So how can we listen more actively according to this um, approach, Roger's approach? Paraphrasing, check your understanding by summarizing the, the person's words out loud in your own words. Invite clarification. So what might be an example of that? And that might encourage the person, to, the client to say more. Reflect feelings, saying something like, it sounds frustrating, might mirror what you're sensing from the person's body language and intensity. Okay, so we're back to the learning target reviews already. So psychotherapy is treatment involving psychological techniques. It consists of interactions between a trained therapist of some kind and someone seeking to overcome psychological difficulties or achieve personal growth. The major psychotherapies derive from psychology's psychodynamic, humanistic, behavioral, and cognitive approaches. And today we talked mostly about psychodynamic and humanistic approaches, both considered insight therapies. So an eclectic approach combines techniques from various forms of psychotherapy. Biomedical therapy treats psychological disorders with medications or procedures that act directly on a patient's physiology. Through psychoanalysis, Freud tried to give people self-insight and relief from their disorders by bringing anxiety-laden feelings and thoughts into conscious awareness. Techni techniques included using free association interpretation of instances of resistance and transference. Contemporary psychodynamic therapy has been influenced by traditional psychoanalysis, but it is briefer, less expensive, and more focused on helping with actual symptoms. Therapists help clients understand themes that run through past and current relationships. Both psychoanalytic and humanistic therapies are considered insight therapies as they attempt to improve functioning by increasing clients' awareness of motives and defenses. Now, with that said, there are some very big differences. <laughs> Roger's client-centered therapy proposes, proposes that therapists' most important contribution are to function as sort of a psychological mirror, sort of reflecting through active listening and to provide a growth-fostering environment of unconditional positive regard. The goals of humanistic therapy are to help clients grow in self-awareness and self-acceptance, to promote personal growth rather than curing illness, to help clients take responsibility for their own growth, to focus on conscious thoughts rather than unconscious motives, motivations, and see the present and future as more important than the past. You can see how there's some really big differences compared to the Freudian psychoanalysis. And that is the last slide for this module. Thank you for listening. Take care.